<clears throat> My name is Rishi. I work for Data Cash. Um, I'm just going to start by uh, telling you a bit about Data Cash and myself, just to give some context. And as, as was alluded to earlier, talk about omni channel retail and more specifically fraud and risk management within an omni channel retail environment. Then I really want to talk a little bit about the current fraud trends that we have seen um, in our, across our customer base and how we have found innovative solutions for that. And then, as we all are aware, <clears throat> within a retail um, setting, customer experience is of utmost importance. So how, from a fraud and risk perspective, we would ensure good customer experience. And then at the end, some pointers for you to take away and a little bit about how Data Cash has solved the problem and some stats to share with you. Okay, so Data Cash is a global payment service provider. Um, we process a billion transactions worldwide for payments. Um, fraud screen transactions for over 180 countries and um, payments are processed and fraud screened for all, over 40 alternative payment methods. Um, I have been in the industry for about 10 years now. Uh, last five years have been spent developing fraud and risk products within an e-commerce setting um, using predictive modeling and self-learning. Okay, so let's jump into um, omnichannel retail. So before I do that, I just want to just set the scene a little bit from my perspective, what I think is important to a, a, a retailer. So to a retailer, um, according to the recent survey of Western European retailers, um, the top business priorities for 2012 are um, sales performance, um, enhanced customer experience, and um, top drivers for IT investment include increasing revenue, increasing product productivity, um, um, retaining existing customers, and finally, effective return on marketing spend. And that's where really omnichannel comes in. So, you know, it's, it's not a buzzword. It is a way of achieving your organization objectives. Now, um, as, as, as was alluded to in the last presentation, multi-channel essentially is where a customer buys your product and services over many channels, perhaps in-store and online. Um, a multi-channel customer, on average, is, uh, spends 15 to 30% more than a single-channel customer. An omni-channel customer, at the end, spends 20% more on average than a multi-channel customer. And, and that the figures kind of speak for themselves, 15 to 30% increase in average transaction size due to a omni-channel customer engagement, 20 to, 6, 20 to 60% reduction in inventory losses, 30 to 45% increase in, increase in online conversion rates, and also drives good customer experience. So what is it exactly? So it's, 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 a, it's take the best of both. So take the best of online and offline and merge the two. So it's an evolution on multi-channel in that you have an integrated, consistent approach across your channels. So the customer has a seamless buying experience. So this will include things like product lines offered, pricing, and merchandising activities. This, is all, this would also cover um, your, your sort of operational activities, which also need to span across, need to be consistent across all your channels. So for example, inventory management, um, payments and fraud screening, and how, do you, how you gather and apply business intelligence. So what I really want to tell you about is how you would manage fraud and risk in this kind of setting. So it's, 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 it's not about uh, ripping out what you have got today, carry on with what you have today. It's about making, just like your business strategy, your fraud and risk strategy also spans across all your channels. So keep what you have today, keep working with it, but at the same time build more layers on top of that. So continue, with, continue tracking chargebacks, fraudulent patterns, uh, uh, specific to channels, but at the same time build more layers on top so that you have ways of correlating data activity across channels. And as, as, as we always recommend, you know, there, there is no silver bullet for fraud mitigation. Use a combination of strategies, such as rule-based analysis, which we alluded to in the last presentation, and use of um, online behavioral analytics for more of the esoteric fraud um, trends that we see today. And most importantly, um, is sharing data, so good and bad customer data. And I'm going to talk about the importance of good customer data in a minute and share that across channels and ensure that, that you get the most out of your data. So now I want to bring this to life for you and so it's show you how it applies to an e-commerce setting, for example. So how you would evolve an e-commerce fraud mitigation strategy into a omni-channel strategy. 
So this is, I'm going to use the five layers of fraud prevention according to Gartner to just demonstrate, demonstrate this for you. So layer one within an e-commerce setting is endpoint centric. So here we are looking at what device or the endpoint the customer is using to connect to the internet. So whether that is a laptop, a, a tablet, or a mobile device. And, and in, this, in this context, we use technologies, for example, device IDs or resolving IP addresses to pinpoint the device, identify the device, and assess the risk accordingly. Next um, layer in that is navigation layer centric. So here we are talking about the browser or whatever medium is being used to interact with your products, your service essentially. And, and, and analyzing web sessions, analyzing the navigation layer sessions, comparing that behavior to known good and bad behaviors, and then on, on that basis, assessing your risk. The next layer, again, specific to e-commerce, uh, the e-commerce channel is you looking at user and account-centric behavior, but for one channel, so e-commerce in this instance. So here, what we're trying to achieve is look at patterns, again, um, fraudulent patterns, good and bad, use statistical models and rules to, 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 to identify risks where you, they, they may be, and then, and then um, make sure that there isn't any criminal or collusive activity going on on your site or within your specific channel. With layer four is where we start entering the realms of omni-channel. So here we are looking at user and account-centric behavior, not just one for one user, but across multiple channels, across multiple products. So like layer three, you would look at the, 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 the suspect activity, but you would correlate activities and, and information across channel for that specific user to ensure that um, there is, they, they are not perpetrating fraud across channels. Perhaps they use a separate card on, online and they use a separate card in store. And how, how do you correlate that? Finally, I want to talk about entity link analysis, which was again alluded to earlier. It is essentially looking at entities external or internal to your, to your organization, and so your staff, for example, and customers, and maybe look at how accounts or users are interacting with your various channels, and see perhaps look at attributes for entities. So for, for example, the cards they use, the shipping addresses, billing addresses used, the devices they use, and then use those to link up and find relationships between entities and eliminate fraud in that way. So to sum up this part of the presentation, what I'm really trying to say is, you know, as you can see from the layers, you are starting with a very channel-specific approach, evolving that, bringing that together into layer four and layer five, which would apply to all your other channels as well. Okay, next I want to talk about um, AVS fraud. So this is, is, is not a new fraud type. I'm sure most of you are aware of it already. Um, I'm gonna, for those who aren't, I'm just gonna summarize it a little bit. But we have seen resurgence of this across our merchant base, across our 30,000 merchants that we serve. And, and we have found new ways, we have had to find new ways to deal with the problem, and I just want to talk a little bit about that. So AVS, Address Verification Services, are services provided by issuing banks, where they allow, where numerics within the address or postcode as supplied by the customer of the merchant can be compared against the numerics held by the issuing bank against the card that they have. If the, if the numerics match, then this particular transaction would or account would pass the AVS postcode and address check. If they don't match, it would fail the AVS postcode check. Now, AVS uh, uh, checking in you know, accounts uh, is, provides some degree of assurance against fraud, but fraud fraudsters have found ways to to work around that. So an AVS, AVS fraud service, essentially what they were trying to do is, is try to match the original numerics held by the issuing bank. But at the same, in order to pass the AVS check, so just go under the radar, but at the same time use an address that is different from the one registered with the card. So I'm just gonna use an example to demonstrate that. So address B here, for example, in Merseyside is the legitimate address perhaps registered on the card but the fraudster decides to use the address in Tunbridge, which, are, which is quite far away, really. And, um, but if you, can, if you look closely, you will find that the numbers, the numerics, actually are the same, and this address would pass the AVS check. So having said that, I'm not saying AVS checks are not effective, but it is one part of the many layers, as I alluded to earlier, that you need to use, you need to, use to ensure fraud and risk is mitigated effectively. So what is the solution? So we analyze data from across our merchant base 
we looked at addresses, um, which are good and bad addresses that had notification of AVS fraud against them, and kind of identified patterns and came up with a solution. So as part of our normal sort of process, we keep card address history for about two years for every customer, every user in our database. And negative rules were deployed, um, rules as were alluded to in the last presentation as well. So a negative rule essentially would, uh, when it would trigger, would increase the risk associated to a transaction. So three sets of rules were created. So when a transaction would pass the AVS check, whether it's an address check, postcode check, or both, um, a rule would trigger when an, there, there's a change in address that has not seen, which has been seen for the first time basically, and is not in the history that we hold for that card. Again, rules were put in place to look at the, new, uh, the lettering around the postcode and comparing that to the details that we've, we hold already. These simple changes, they don't really um, sound that complicated, but have been very effective to actually mitigate the resurgence of this fraud trend and I'm gonna share some numbers later in the presentation to give you some evidence of how well it worked for us. Next item I want to talk about is good customer experience. So, you know, we, we, customer experience, as I alluded to earlier, is one of the top priorities for a lot of retailers in 2012, and what can we do from a fraud and risk perspective to ensure that the customer has a good customer experience? So, I mean, obviously, from a raw fraud and risk perspective, our primary objective is to reduce fraud costs, reviews chargeback costs, minimize manual reviews, but at the same time, we don't want to hinder genuine customers, except genuine business, and at the same time, not impact the, 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 um, the experience of a genuine customer. So how do, we, how do we fix that? The way to do that, very simply, again, is, is in the analysis, the, the, the kind of the method you use to identify these transactions. And in addition to negative rules, use positive rules. So a positive rule where a customer or an individual exhibits behavior that is, that is um, um, desired or it is something that is genuine, then you would use that to, increase, uh, to reduce the risk associated with that transaction. So together, they are giving you a true picture of, the, of, that, of that user's legitimacy or how genuine or not genuine they are. So the way this has been implemented operationally is um, with the use of something we call confidence indexing. So essentially, this, um, this, it's an algorithm that runs within the data database, and it, it gives a good confidence index to every unique user within the database. So we, we use a set of attributes. For example, you could use email address, card, and um, their home address to uniquely identify a user. Once you've done that, Based on successful purchase histories held in the database, you would assign a confidence, a good or bad, or whatever your confidence rating for that merchant, uh, sorry, for that customer is, and, and, then, and then use that to assess the, you know, the, how good or bad that customer is. You wouldn't assign a confidence index to a customer where there has been any negative status associated to that customer. So perhaps you've had chargebacks or complaints or rejections around that customer. And the results kind of speak for themselves. Um, for a big airline customers of, of ours in 2011, we processed 1.3 million transactions, um, out of which 670K were hit by one confidence index or the other, which is about 52% of those transactions. And the result was more, or no chargeback fraud in the month of December. Let's say we did not have these positive rules in place. We, you, we would have seen 9,000 extra manual reviews or referrals just in the month of December, which, which would amount to 302 extra manual reviews per day. So that is not only a huge cost on the organization in terms of uh, um, employing additional resources to get through that additional workload, but at the same time, it is inconveniencing the customer, perhaps based on how your business model deals with manual reviews. So some, some may decide to hold the payment or refund the payment or take the payment anyway, but either way, it is inconveniencing somebody. So that's my bit on good customer experience. So just sort of summarize it for you now, really. So omni-channel is here. Um, just like your um, business strategy needs to scale across many channels and be seamless, so does your fraud strategy needs to be seamless and needs to scale across all your channels. AVS fraud is on the rise. Use um, address change related rules to mitigate that threat. And good customer experience can be ensured by um, placing as much importance on good data 
on genuine behavior as you do on identifying negative or bad behavior. And you know, uh, these techniques and other many techniques like that have helped data cash reduce fraud across the merchant base. So for every 100 pounds that we screen, the merchant gets, um, we reject 32p as suspect fraud, and the merchant on top of that gets 4p worth of chargeback. And um, here's a little bit about data cash, really. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me now, or you know, we are at Stand 15, come and visit us. Thanks very much.